All right, folks, welcome, welcome. Chris Garlock here with Michael Redman, Nine Don Professional Go player. I'm the managing editor of the American Go e-journal. Thanks so much for joining us for what I'm sure is gonna be a very special evening of Go. Uh, we'll talk very briefly about the, uh, the game that we're gonna be presenting tonight, and then we have a little bit of other business to take care of. But uh, Michael, this is another in our series of historic games. Uh, we've done some pretty old games in the past, uh, four or 500 years old, but this one, not quite so old, right? It's uh, uh, the 1930s, late 1930s. Um, very famous uh, set of games, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, some, of, some of your favorite games, too, actually, right? Oh, yeah, I'm always a fan of Go Sagan. He's one of the players. And he's playing against his best friend and maybe I could call him his uh, best rival also, Kitani Minori, Minoru. Okay, we'll talk about that as well. Uh, just some housekeeping things. Uh, thanks to the American Go Association, usgo.org. You can find out uh, all about Go uh, if you go there, uh, where to play, how to play, uh, all that kind of stuff. So check that out. You can also join the uh, US uh, Go, uh, the American Go Association at usgo.org. Uh, also, of course, our producer, Stephen, who will be helping us to field your questions. We are live, uh, so we'll be monitoring the chat. So if you've got questions, just, uh, uh, just don't be shy. You know, our Go audience is usually not, so <laughs> we're <laughs> looking forward to uh, talking, talking with you, answering your questions. And um, for folks that don't know it, Michael, of course, is a top professional player, but he's also got a special interest in, in Go history and Japanese history. I think all kinds of history is fair to say, right, Michael? Raising the hurdle here, right? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Okay. Um, but before we get into that, I um, wanted to talk a little bit about what's happening uh, with Go in Japan uh, as it uh, it's begun to restart the professional scene uh, in, in recent weeks after being shut down for a couple of oh. months. So we're back to 2020, right? We are back to 2020. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, oh, the games are starting again, yeah. Um, but they are starting very slowly because um, even while playing Go, like Go is a very uh, a game where you're just right across the board from your opponent. So they uh, we feel that we have to be careful about that. And the games are to a certain degree, they're socially distanced. So like in a room where you used to hold 20 to 30 games, I think there's more like 10 games in that room. So it's, mm -hmm. it's less less games that can be played in one week. And actually, I haven't played any tournament games since they restarted, which was just a couple of weeks ago. So my turn hasn't come yet. I did ref once. I did. I was a referee. So I was going to say that uh, that seems like that would sort of uh, make the schedule interesting, right? Well, for the time being, they're just playing the games that seem to be close to the top that, that they have to play in order okay. to keep the schedule with the sponsors and stuff like that. And probably um, the organization is hoping that people will be able to relax it later when, when the virus is conquered or something like that. Um, you just have to hope, I suppose. Exactly. Uh, question here, actually, and this is, this is actually an on-topic question about, uh, looks like, Pog Champs, I think it's uh, called, the Twitch Streamer Chess Tournament. Um, <clears throat> now, we had talked about, I know there was an online Go tournament. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, you did some commentaries, uh, like some of these. Oh, yes, the Go Tournament. In that, yeah. So I think, I mean, obviously, we're sort of in this transition period at the, at the moment um, as, as uh, you know, people are trying to open back up. Um, but clearly the virus is going to be with us for a while. Uh, is there any talk about doing some more online tournaments or is that pretty much set to the side for um, now? I think it was just kind of an open window there where even the top tournament players, which are the ones a new um, sponsor would really want, um, were just didn't have anything to do because they didn't have any tournament games to play or anything. And um, even players not at the top had a lot of extra time because there was no face-to-face -face teaching being done either. So everyone had all this extra time and some people like myself um, opening up YouTube channels and stuff like that. 
So um, they tried to organize tournaments. And there, were, there were actually a number of um, sponsors that came up and helped these people set up little tournaments. So mm -hmm. usually they were just kind of invitational tournaments with a few young of the younger professionals who were more ready, you might say, to set up internet connections and stuff like that. Like I, I think Japan, um, the younger people are just so much happier doing playing go on net online and stuff like that. They're much more into it. And so some of some very interesting tournaments came up. Well, and and it, this is sort of apropos uh, to our to our discussion of our game today because uh, you know Go is this game with a very long and and you know beautiful history, uh, and a lot of the attraction for many of us is this this history, you know, mm -hmm. the, the Go board and the pieces, and you know if you can uh, the, some of those special rooms like at the Neon Keen. Uh, you know, it did to have such history to them. Um, you know, not, you know, of course, I'm sure you've seen some of these boards that are hundreds of years old. So, you know, to, to play on a board uh, that maybe some of the masters played on, you know, whether it's, a, you know, from the 30s, uh, like today's game, or, you know, even hundreds of years. And so, you know, I, I love online playing, but it lacks, it lacks some of the, uh, the magic, I suppose, of Go, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, but it was a great opportunity for those top players to get online and play those games. And of course, um, Pandanet was happy to offer the games to me to do the commentary. So that was great. Yeah. And so we could actually show you some games on the net. Yeah. So we'll, we'll keep folks posted. I mean, our commitment, obviously, uh, is to bring you games from all different times, whether they're 400 years old or was 100 years old or just played a few weeks ago. So we're, we're always interested in all the different games. So I uh, hope that you enjoy those. Um, and again, any questions you have, just go ahead and, uh, and let us know, and we will try to, uh, to answer those. So all right, well, I'm looking forward to you getting back on the board. Uh, we've, we've looked at some of your games, and can't wait to see, mm -hmm. give, give you a chance to get back and see how you're, yeah. you're doing. See if I still remember how to play golf. <laughs> Uh, it's been a real bonus, and we should mention uh, a couple of things. And during this uh, special break time, whatever you want to call it, uh, a couple of things. Michael, of course, launched his YouTube channel, and Stephen will put up the link for that. And uh, in fact, while we were getting ready, I was looking at some of his uh, very clever problems that you have. You know, I'm just going to look at them and then kind of got sucked into trying to solve them. So uh, there's some good problems there. And then he also launched his YouTube channel, uh, and we started a brand new series. Uh, we're pretty excited about called uh, AlphaGo versus the World. AlphaGo, of course, being the program who famously uh, beat the Seagull uh, back in 2016, and then went on to uh, become uh, master in late 2016, early 2017. Had a winning streak of 60 games, and we are doing uh, commentaries on all 60, but we're doing. Uh, pretty short. I think the longest is maybe 20 minutes or so. Most of them are around. No, it gets longer every time we set a time, you know. <laughs> we're, we're about 20 minutes. The, rec the record is about 20 minutes now. Yeah. 15, 20 minutes. But uh, it's kind of fun, and it's a good way to kind of get a feeling. So um, I think Stephen's putting up the link for that. But check those out. We're, we're having a lot of fun doing them and uh, getting pretty good feedback. People seem to be enjoying them. Yes. Yeah, so you can check those out. Those are on both uh, Michael's YouTube channel, and we've also got a link on the uh, AGA's YouTube channel. So lots of content. So we have uh, we have not been idle during this uh, during this break, but working working hard. So check those out. Hope you enjoy those. All right, uh, <clears throat> let's um, let's talk a little bit about. Um, I think both uh, both players uh, tell us a little bit, and we can get more in, as we go along. But why don't you introduce us to both players and then set up uh, this particular game, which was part of a, a series of games, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, well, Gosegen is world famous, uh, the English and Japanese pronunciation of his name. And um, he was a Chinese um, player. and was found by some Japanese professionals who were traveling in China. He, he was a genius from the start. And the time he came to Japan, he was already probably professional one, professional, professional level. And he became one of the star players in the Japanese Go Association, which was the only 
um, professional organization that was really functioning at that time. And so at the time, I think he was still a seven don at the time of this uh, Jubango. Um, and his opponent was Kitani Minoru, uh, who is well, most well known as the, um, the teacher of the Kitani Dojo, the Kitani school, which is this school that turned out like um, dozens of top level players who um, made Go history in the 20th century. So all these, and there's, some of them are still um, top players, of course, but they, they took all the titles, basically, most all of, all of the titles in the 20th century when, when we had um, newspaper sponsored tournaments started up um, in the second half of the 20th century. The Kitani school like took most of them. They were very, very successful. And so it's attributed to the system that Kitani Minoru set out for them. But actually, he was a very good uh, a top player in, in his own. He was one of uh, Gosegan's um, biggest rivals. Mm -hmm. Also, he was the person who worked to get together with Gosegan because they had a great friendship. They worked together to create the new opening, the Shinfuseki, which, um, which they sort of disclosed, you might say, in the early 1930s. So this game that I'm, we're going to look at today was 1939. So that was after the Shinfuseki. And it's interesting because Go, the Shinfuseki was an idea where people would play, Gosegan's idea on it was to play just uh, star points or three, three points and finish off the corner with one move and move quickly to the sides in the center of the board. So it's very similar to what AIs do right now, actually. The way Kitani interpreted it was slightly different because he liked to make big moyos in the center of the board. So he would be playing um, unusual corner moves like five, five point or the five, three point also sometimes. He liked to have a, a high position and then he would make a big moyo, um, preferably in the center of the board. And he, he played with that for a few years. But at the time of this game, he's gone back to his original style, which is the opposite of that. He's going to play tight simar, tight corner enclosures, and he's going to be taking territory. And so it's going to be a kind of an opposite style that Kitani plays when compared to Gosei. So it's interesting how the Shinfuseki, although it influ influenced both of them very strongly, they ended up playing opposite styles. Mm. A couple of other things I think we are up there mentioning. First of all, you, you sort of mentioned uh, that Go Sagan was originally from China. Uh, a few things, obviously, Go was invented in, in China some over some 4,000 years ago. Um, and then it uh, came to Japan where it was professionalized and you had the professional Go players. Um, and then uh, the, the Japanese had, had most of the pros and, and were the, you know, dominated, uh, you know, the, the go scene uh, for many years, uh, of course, and then the Koreans uh, became quite strong, and now the Chinese, of course, are, are incredibly strong. Um, it's worth mentioning all this because at the time um, when, when Go Sagan came up, it was a big deal um, when, when Go Sagan came to Japan. I mean, there was really no go scene in China to speak of at that time. I mean, there was no professionals, you couldn't make a living as a Go player there. Right, well, um, Go has such a long history of thousands of years um, that I, I sort of have a th uh, hypothesis just looking back into Chinese history that every time the political system is stabilized and they have a flourishing country, then they did have players who could be called pros and players who could make a living out of or were devoting their whole lives to playing Go, you might say. Some of them were rich to start with and they didn't have to gain any money. And so there's various um, ways that it showed that there were players who were dedicating their lives to the game. Mm -hmm. When they had a, a stable political environment and these players could find opponents and, and places to show their strength. And basically at this time in history in the 1930s, that was the difference between Japan um, and before that also, the difference between Japan and China and Korea was that Japan was very stable politically and the central government was very strong. It made it um, easier to have such a system. And there was, there was a great interest, I think, in the game in all, all of Asia. It was just that the stability that Japan had made it so much easier for people to spend their lives dedicated fully to this board game. Mm -hmm. Now, this particular series, and I, I think they're, they're called a, a series of these, and, uh, and Go lingo is called a jubango, right? Uh, these games were called jubango. That's a Japanese word. 
Um, in English, it would be called the 10 game match. Okay. Um, it's just that these, uh, Go Sagan played a series of these bangos, which were matches, um, in which they had a set of games, the number of games was predetermined. And it was using an old system where you could change the handicap. So you would start maybe with an even game, but if a certain player had four more wins than the opponent, then the handicap would change so that the losing player would be playing, taking black more or something like that. And so first they would be alternating black and white. In this case, they started with an even. So that's how they did it. Mm -hmm. um, and then if the games continued, then um, one player would be having white more often. So it was, it would change the, the relative status of the two players. So there was a lot of pride involved because in fact, in many cases, the player would just quit the Juvango um, if he lost more than four games compared to his opponent because he didn't want to be playing at a handicap. It would just be too embarrassing, wouldn't it? It'd just be too embarrassing. <laughs> That's very important, very important. Uh, not really, but <clears throat> at the time. Um, so there's a couple other things, and we'll get more into these as we go along. Some folks are asking about uh, Go Sagan's accident, but I think we can wait until a little bit later to talk about that. Um, you had mentioned when we were getting ready for this that that uh, these were. This is reminding me of you know when we had the uh, the Lisa Doll AlphaGo games, and we were in Seoul, and people had TVs, and we we're watching on the big screens, and. You know, that was very unusual for us to see in our lifetime. We'd never seen Go with that kind of attention. But at the time that this game was played, or the series of, in 1939, mm -hmm. it was somewhat similar, right? It was very similar. It was, there was a great interest, public interest in the game, but partly because Go was so widely popular. Also, the fact that I think that they had less recreation. Um, um, I'm not really sure about the uh, history of TV, actually, but they did have public commentaries and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and the newspapers, um, the, the newspaper that was sponsoring this and, and various newspapers did sponsor various um, 10 game or three game matches. And they got a lot of publicity out of that. So some people will say that the newspapers got big on, on these goal matches because mm -hmm. they didn't really have that much recreation or stuff to, to show to people at the time. Um, and just looking at the dates, 1939, the whole world is in this surge of nationalism and they're heading towards the second world war. And of course, Japan is right in the middle of that. And so you have to be patriotic to get into the newspaper basically. And so it was very difficult and go is one of the things that they, um, that was sort of okay to, to be publicized like that. Mm -hmm. And so there was this huge interest in it and a lot of publicity. So it was great for Goal and for the newspapers involved, I think. Yeah. Well, lots more to talk about, and uh, we will do that as we go along, but we'll get into the game. And I know we've got a lot of folks who are just seeing Go for the first time. So, uh, Michael, I may be asking some some very basic questions as, as we go forward. This, very good, very good. I'll, I'll look forward to that. Uh, folks, don't be afraid to, to ask if you're not sure about a term that we use or if you have any questions at all. Uh, all questions are good. We are very happy to, uh, to have you here, uh, and we're uh, very pleased to be on Twitch. We've been doing Sundays for, for quite a while now. It's been, it's been fun. Quite a while, yeah, almost every week. Yeah, yeah good, good way to, uh, to stay busy during the pandemic. So thanks for being here today. All right, Michael, let's, uh, let's take a look at this famous historic, the, oh, oh, I forgot, Kamakura. Why Kamakura? It's just where they got together to play the games. Um, like nowadays, professionals will be traveling all over the place and changing the locality with each game. Um, but for some reason, they they played these games in Kamakura. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't really know exactly why. It was, it was a very beautiful, I'm sure they had a, a great place to be playing it. And maybe they just decided to stay there. Uh, it was probably a part, uh, the historic thing again, the fact that they, probably a time in Japan where it was relatively difficult to be doing a lot of traveling. Mm -hmm. Is there anything particular that we should know about Kamakura? I don't, I don't, I've never been there. It's a place that um, long in the past, um, I'm not that crazy about history to be able to tell you exactly when, but there was a time when there, it was the center of the Japanese government. Uh, and now, now it's a place where you go if you lot, want to look at ancient buildings and beautiful temples and stuff like that. Um, and it's, it's a, it's, so it's turned into a tourist spot. It's, it's a historic area of Japan now. So it's, um, that's, people go to it for that. Um, I think they were just using it for a fancy 
um, Yokan hotel like place um, and a good location. Thanks. Okay, let's take a look. Okay, so like I was saying, Kitani is going for territory, and Gosegan with white is going for the star point. He's, he's going to play a more speedy opening. And he's starting to show his two space high approach move here, which is one of his favorite moves. And Kitani has changed back to the style where he is just taking territory. So this is what he's doing here. And it's really interesting with Gosegan because you will see him starting with. Uh, the approach move here, and then black plays underneath, and then goes again most quite often play away. So this is one way you can get to this shape. But also sometimes you will see goes again playing that mark move, the shoulder hit after black has played this mark, after black has played the corner and closer. So it's interesting that he can goes again can get to this position with two orders of moves. It's also interesting that while Kitani would always take the corner territory, well, actually not always, in the other corner, he, take, he plays this way. So he, he answers White's approach both times, but actually it's um, probably better for Black to take an open corner. It's very slight, but just giving it the machine um, analysis, the computer analysis gives a better score for Black if Black does this. Um, and this variation, like this Joseki, when White plays an attachment at the 3-3 point in the upper right corner, it can get very complicated. But it turns out um, it's perfectly OK for Black just to play this relatively simple variation where Black is just setting up to capture those two white stones in the corner. White does get to squeeze. But there's this cutting point on the fifth line there that White has to answer to protect. And Black gets to play this final point on the upper side. And the idea is that white's got an outside thickness, but it will be difficult for white to get too much from it, partly because the side is um, open underneath. And the fact that black has played this move on the, on the left side will make it difficult for white to make efficient use of this wall. So the, the actual territory that black gets is more valuable. So this is how I would play now. I, I would probably take the open corner. And now I've studied it, it would be very, very easy for, for me to follow this Joseki because it's a very straightforward sequence. So I'd probably just play this way. In the game, Kitani answers and answers. So we have a very Gosegan like opening. He, he really plays a very fast paced style and takes a, um, allows his opponent to take some extra territory and goes for control of large spaces. So th this is just like what AIs like to play. So it's very similar. Um, apart from the fact that the AI, the programs want black to play away from whites of, of these approach moves. And so they think that maybe these approach moves are premature. Uh, once black answers like this, he's, he's sort of back in sync with the, he's back in agreement with the computer programs. You know, Michael, uh, there's an interesting question about, uh, about your mark stone is or whether an AI might want to attach a D4 uh, at some point. Is that, is that something an AI might consider? You're talking about the lower left corner? Yes. Um, not after not after that. Like um, White's next move sometimes would be the 3-3 three, three point, the C3 point. And that will involve a trade. So um, that's one move that White could be aiming to play later on. Mm -hmm. Actually, you see it in um, Gosegan Go often suggested this attachment at the 3-3 point later in um, his new Fuseki um, set of uh, lessons, you might say. He was, he was giving us lessons, a set of lessons. And this is one of the moves that he liked to use a lot. Um, but he, he's not using it at this time in, in his career. Right. It's, right. A, it's a difficult, it's going to be a, a trade if, black, if white plays there. Gotcha. OK, thanks. Um, in the upper right corner, um, at a certain point in history, Gosegan started pushing on the fourth line at the P60. Mm -hmm. And that was when we started to get the, the large Nandare, the mm -hmm. large Avalanche uh, Joseki variations that were very, very complicated and were being discovered at that time. So people were, were actually researching these new Joseki variations that were called the large Avalanche that were started by um, Gosegan playing this way. 
So a couple of things that we should mention for the folks that are just seeing this game for the first time, uh, you know, the goal of the game is to, uh, you know, capture or surround more territory, maybe even as little as a half a point more territory than your opponent. And uh, the easiest way to do that is to start from the corners, uh, you know, moving out. You know, obviously, if you're in the middle of the board, it's difficult to surround territory there. Uh, and then these sequences that you're seeing in the corners uh, are what are called Josekis, which are basically um, sequences that have been, some of them are hundreds of years old. And, and it's an interesting time in history because, as you were just referring to, in the 30s, there was quite a bit of change going on in these sequence things that people have been playing for hundreds of years. Um, people like O. Sagan and Katani were kind of just, you know, they, they, I think you've talked about this before, you know, like AlphaGo, they were kind of disrupting the situation, weren't they? Well, yeah, there were Josekis that lasted for a hundred years, but the great majority of Joseki sequences actually was changing all the time. Um, and I think the thing that made these avalanche Josekis um, so dramatic was the fact that they were just so much more exciting and dangerous and so much more action was happening on them that, that, that they were more in the public eye. But actually, like even if we go back several hundreds of years, professionals were constantly researching new, new moves and testing them out against each other. Mm -hmm. And it's a continual process. Um, it's just the fact that in modern times, when we have AIs that are really good at um, giving us positional judgments, the the speed of our innovating is has sped up so much. Like um, we in, in in when I was a young goal player, it usually took about three months for a new move to become established because people would have to play it, and then eventually there would be a consensus as to whether or not it was good or not. And people would have to have that amount of data to really have a good idea about it. And then um, there was a point in history where Koreans and then the Chinese started to sort of um, get into groups and just play a huge amount of games, as many games as possible using the same shape. And that's how they researched new Joseki and that sped it up. And so it was like a couple of weeks, two or three weeks. Um, and they would have a good idea of whether that new move was working in a, per a particular opening. And so that speeded up uh, quite noticeably. And now we have AIs, which just give us a point score that is pretty reliable, um, that gives us the positional judgment and who's, who's, who's profited from this. It gives us a whole board positional judgment from which we can pretty much feel safe in deciding which side profited in a, a certain um, particular fight. Mm -hmm. And so that means that uh, it's just a matter of, it, um, Someone could research a new variation in one day, basically. Right. If he, uh, yeah, if he worked at it. Well, a couple of things we should mention is uh, one is that these sequences are all situationally based. So some some something that Michael may talk about will be sequences. Um, but if you change, for example, he's talking about in the upper right corner. But if the stone in the upper left corner uh, were to change right now, it's a D17. If it were a D16. If it were at C17, if it were at D, D16, and those are three obvious places that it might be, for example, mm -hmm. um, then the sequence, the value of the sequence in the upper right would be probably pretty different, change. right? Yeah, it would change. The way the players would want to exit that local fight would change, and the value of the resulting position would change, depending on just a very slight difference in the position of even one other stone, as you were say, stating. Um, you mentioned four possible, three or four possible points where, which would be good moves for White to have that final move in the upper left corner. And they would all have an effect on what was happening on the other side of the board. And so the computer programs will actually um, give us a reliable um, score for, for our positional judgment of that. Uh, while humans tend to be better at researching the local position, um, just because computers are giving us a score for the entire board, sometimes it's hard to tell um, what the best local move is sometimes when the computer is is giving a more general figure, you might say. Right. So it makes it interesting because it's not, 
Uh, when you're starting to learn Go, a lot of times people will want to memorize the Josekis. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, it, it's, uh, it's hard to say whether it's good or bad because the problem is that you can memorize a sequence, but if you play the right sequence in the wrong place or at the wrong time, uh, then, it, then it's not necessarily the right sequence. So they're not, they're, how shall I say, um, just, just knowing the sequence doesn't, is not necessarily the end. Uh, you have to play the right, right sequence yeah. in the right place at the right time, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yeah, it's very difficult to give a set of Josekis that are sort of universally right. good. Um, and basically, if you have a Joseki that involves a long sequence of moves, first of all, if you're just learning the game, you're not gonna you're gonna have a hard time memorizing it. And secondly, your opponent has this, has the same problem, and you don't won't know what to do when your opponent doesn't play the the right sequence of moves. And it's um, it's usually very difficult to utilize for weaker players. Also, there's the fact that um, those are the Joseki sequences that usually change with time. So by the time you're strong enough to use it, maybe it's going to be changed to something different. <laughs> so I, I sort of like to suggest people should try to find Josekis that are relatively universally useful and also that have a relatively small number of moves in the sequence. So here's a good question from somebody who's uh, come over from chess. Uh, and he's wondering, uh, uh, they're wondering how developed is opening theory of Go and whether professionals spend 90% of their time, like they do in chess, uh, studying openings and memorizing them. And I think you're sort of coming, you were sort of answering that a bit there. Um, we spend a lot of time on the opening. Um, I think that we have a better understanding of the local positions that we are calling Josegis that usually happen in, in the corner areas. Um, and with the whole opening, like there's something like um, more than 300 choices with each move. <laughs> and it becomes an astronomical number of possible game positions. Right. Um, becomes, it's, it's just something that we have come to a realization that we don't understand it. Mm -hmm. And we do, we do have a lot of um, ideas, a lot of, you might say, theories, openings that have worked to a certain degree. And we're working with them, but we don't really know if they're 100% correct or not. And it's getting better with the use of AIs, of course, because they are giving us scores. But um, it's just something we, we have a much more accurate understanding of the middle game and the end game. So actually, even the end game is fairly challenging so that most amateur players um, will be making a lot of mistakes in the end game. And so, Actually, studying the end game is more useful, although it's maybe not so exciting. It's more useful because um, it makes your game accurate, and that's quite in many cases that's where the game is decided. And then also the middle game is an area where we can usually understand or figure out what the best moves was, and so that's another area where we can get a result. While we in actual games we might have time issues and stuff like that that make it difficult. Um, the middle game is a, 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 a part of the game where we can uh, figure it out if we have enough time. Well, and an interesting sort of, since we're talking chess and go, um, interesting uh, difference is that, well, two, two is that uh, chess, 64 squares, pieces have uh, limited ways that they can move. So the number of variations for each move are significantly smaller in chess than in go, because in go you have 361 intersections and uh, and there's no limitation. I mean, uh, each player can play wherever they want on an open uh, intersection. So as Michael says, an astronomical number at each move. The other big difference between the games is that the more that you go, uh, the farther along in the game that you go and, and go, the, the board fills up. And so you have fewer and fewer sort of options. So by the time he's talking about like an end game, it's pretty limited number. So it's still a lot, but it's a much smaller number. Whereas, of course, in chess, uh, the you know you have fewer and fewer pieces uh, as the game goes along. Uh, whenever I play, I always had you know <laughs> my my king being chased around. By, you know, uh, yeah, know. I think that the number, the difference in the numbers there makes a big difference if you have a computer program doing something like a brute force approach, right? And it has to read out all of the variations. Of course, with the way computers are going, maybe they're going to be able to do that anyway. And then, but like 
it's amazing how computers are developing too. But basically, the biggest difference for was for computers because I think top human players, the stronger you get, I think um, when you get the the top, there's probably a limited number of moves that you're thinking about anyway. Like, right. That's true for go players. It's probably true for chess players. They probably have only a few moves that look good to them to start with. Sure. And um, there's thinking from there, and the fact that makes it relatively. I have the feeling that games like Go and Chess and Shogi are probably, to top players, they're probably a similar level of difficulty mm. because the moves that the players are actually thinking about are um, just their experience allows them to limit in a very human way. They, they, um, they just sort of know what moves they might want to play. And so they have a limited number of moves that they're thinking about. Cool. Good questions, folks. Excellent questions. Uh, always happy to uh, to have some uh, chess players over here discovering uh, Go. And I see uh, Stephen ran a poll, and a lot of you are return viewers. And in fact, we are over 1,300 now. So that's terrific. Glad to have you all here. Again, Chris Garlock, Managing Editor of the American Go eJournal, here with Michael Redmond, Nine Don Professional, one of the top players in the world. We're very happy to, uh, to have you here. And uh, let's let's get back to uh, some more Josekis. Right. Yeah. Well, actually, um, since White is playing away from the upper right corner and the lower left corner, it's not going to be that complicated as far as the Josekis are concerned. In fact, Black actually gets to push here first. So this, with this, Black has established a strong position in the upper right, and this is where Gosegan actually he plays his extension, which was a kind of a favorite move for him um, at any point it would have been okay for white to play away and play something like this in, in the upper left corner. And computer programs just really like to play away like this. So this would be the suggested move. But um, he extended here. And I, oh, sorry, he extended here. And I think that it might be that he just, he knew something about Kitani. Actually, they played a similar game just, I think it was a few weeks earlier than this. And he just knew that Kitani would be continuing to play in the upper, uh, upper left, upper right corner. So Black pushed again, and this is where I was telling you that you know, um, both Kitani and Gosegan. I think we've talked about it once. They were both happy at this point, and Gosegan actually talked to me about that when I was at his study group, and he was reminiscing about this game. He was saying that, well, he was really happy because he was getting all these free moves on the outside and he was going to be controlling the center of the board. He was really happy about that. But of course, Kitani was saying that, you know, he was getting territory um, surrounding from the fifth line here. So this has got to be good for Black, because usually the general idea was that even if Black was surrounding territory on the fourth line, that would be good. And you're going to see Kitani crawling on the fifth line here. So that as far as surrounding this area on the right side, it's going to be very uh, very efficient for Black. It's going to be a lot of points for each stone he plays. And so there's two ways to think about this. And I think the two players, just because they were so friendly with each other, although it's a very important game they're playing, um, they were enjoying the differences that they have here. And also, this is a point where Black curls around on the third line, where the usual move would be the slide. This, the slide I'm talking about is on the second line here. This was the the local shape. This was the Joseki move in this position. And um, in a previous game, he in a similar position, a similar board position, he had played, he had curled around like this. Kitani was just like, he, at the time he was playing this kind of style where he had a very solid position and his opponent had no co-threats. And you'd be amazed at the number of codes that Kitani sets up in his games. Like he, would, he just takes territory and his opponent gets this huge area and then when you think it's going to be a, his opponent's territory, he jumps in after that. So it's sort of like Jochkun now. And, um, and he starts a coke. So he has these, he starts out with these positions in which his opponent does not have any co threats. And it's going to give him, a, him an advantage when the coke starts. When he played that move, um, he, he is quoted to have said that um, Meijin Sensei will be upset with me. And he's talking about Hoinbo's suicide who is also called the Meijin at the time. Actually, I think he had just freshly retired. He, he played his retirement game, I think, in 1938. So maybe he was freshly retired, but he was still a very important force in the Go world. 
and he would comment on their game. So actually fairly recently from this game, he had commented on a game that Kitani played in which he curled around like this in a similar position when Susai thought he should have played here. And he was upset with him for that. So at the time, it was a big deal if the most prominent player was upset at you for playing what he thought was a bad move. Well, we've, we've talked about this before, Michael. We were sort of kidding about it, but um, you know, in the Japanese culture, I mean, I mean, uh, and, and 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 China and Korea for that matter, um, reputation is important. Face is important. Uh, your, you know, what your teacher thinks. You know, what the strong players think. This, this is, you know, even today, that's that's you know still somewhat true. But back then. Uh, I mean, you should talk a little bit about this. I mean, you were a student, uh, you were in a study group with Go Sagan as a, as a very young right. man. Oh, yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Bit to contradict him. Of course, he was right most of the time also. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> um, but actually, the, when I talk about the Meiji, that's something that was um, instituted in the Edo era. So like it, the, we had Meijins, um, a best player for about 300 years, and the Meijin would have control. He would be called Meijin Godokoro, and he would have control over the whole gold community because he would be the connection of the gold community to the government who is sponsoring the gold community. And he would have power over them. He would be the final person to choose whether people could uh, get a higher rank or um, he would, so he would help them choose their ranks. And he would mediate between them and the government. So he was a very important and powerful person. And actually, Hoimbo Susai, who I was just talking about, was the last Meiji in this meeting because he had just um, sold the name of Hoimbo to a newspaper and he went into retirement. I think it was the previous year, 1938. And that was the beginning of these tournaments that were sponsored mostly by newspapers at the time. The first big sponsors for Go were newspapers in this era. And he started that by um, just sell, allowing a newspaper to use the name Hoimbo, which was a her, kind of a heredity, hereditary uh, name for the Go School. And they started a tournament called the Hoimbo Tournament, which is not quite started up at this point. So this another thing about this Jubango is that it's filling a gap where um, between the retirement game that Hoimbo Susai played and the new system that is getting started up they haven't got a tile match coming quite yet. They're sort of working towards that. And in between, they had all these 10 game matches and so that Go Sagan was playing. So there was this whole part of Go history where they didn't have anything else going on. There were a lot of sponsors that were coming in to help Go and they didn't have anything to do quite yet. So they started playing these 10 game matches. So- um, No, I was just yeah. thinking it's a little bit, I mean, in some ways, nothing like it, but in some ways, um, you know, we were just talking at the beginning of the stream about, you know, go because of the pandemic and had to, you know, shut down, uh, like, like, you know, all these other sports. I mean, those are my sport. You had all these other sports. I mean, baseball is trying to figure out how to start up soccer. I've you know, tennis, my sports trying to figure out how to start up. And so, you know, it's a time of turmoil and turbulence and nobody knows what's going to happen next. And, and you know, uh, some ways, very, you know, different reasons, but... Very similar, yeah. They had a war then, yeah. <laughs> it was bad, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it is very similar, I think. The, the fact that there is this uncertainty was very similar. Yeah. So back to the game. A white oh, plays a large knight oh, Murray. Sorry, there's one more really good question here. Oh, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm going to tell you what the question is, but don't answer it now because it's not a simple answer. Somebody wants to know uh, if there's a world championship. That's a really, that's actually pretty complicated. So you can think on that and come back and answer that later. Or I could just say yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> it is complicated. Isn't leave it, it at that. Yeah. Okay. Well, we can come back to that later. Okay. It's a good question. It is a good question. There are a number of championships. Yeah, that's that's why it's a complicated answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, Black plays an extension. Um, and this is probably not so big uh, a move. It's another style thing, I think. Like uh, a computer program would have me play here. And something like this might happen. But you're not, you're not going to see this in 1939. Definitely. <laughs> um, Somebody would have been really upset. 
Yes. <laughs> yeah, that would have gotten them into trouble with the, the coin ball. Um, or otherwise, you could have seen something like this, or something like this would be more normal, something more accepted at the time. And even now, I, I would feel perfectly normal playing one of these two approach moves. Something like that, or maybe here, this would also be a very big point. I would feel more comfortable playing this way. Uh, whereas Kinani played here, this is a bit of a strange move, just because this black group is so solid here. Usually you don't play um, in areas that are close to uh, um, a group that is so well settled. And so it's kind of unique to his style because he did like to build up these relatively small territories that were very, very solid. And his opponent would have a loose um, structure and Kitani would just jump in very deeply. And we're gonna see that in this game. So white extends here and black actually protects here. This is really crazy. And it, he, maybe Kitani is the only player who's gonna play this type of move, um, but he's gonna surprise us again. So not only this move, and, and also I, you can see I marked three points on the board. A and B are moves that would come naturally to me. And C is the move that um, an AI, a Go computer program would suggest probably. But B, B is a move that would be coming very natural to me for Black, this, this move. Let me just ask a, a question I mean, here. Um, you know, we, I mean, we're we used to working a lot with doing, you know, the AI games or even the AI human games in our new series. And, and of course, the AI is just all about, you know, moving really fast, taking what we call sente, which is the, the chance to move first and play away from an area. This, this was not quite happening yet in, in 39, right? Not happening yet. I think Go Sagan was the player who was closest to that idea, and he was always a very a player who liked to um, move around the board very rapidly. So, like, I would not have been surprised to see him, for instance, play at this point to, to somewhere else in the board, which would be perfectly, maybe even better as far as the computer is con concerned. But um, he does tend to play moves like these three white stones, which um, were in the game, they were exchanged for these black, uh, three black stones here. I'll mark, mark the three black stones that black played in exchange for them. And so they were not actually using a tempo, not using one move, because Black was answering them locally. Mm -hmm. And then, then he doesn't take care of them and just leaves them for a while. And he was very good at doing that, like um, playing away and, and taking a position, just because the goal board does have so much space. He's, he's taking a position mostly on this side of the board. Um, and just finding new areas to, to take control of is something that Gosegan was very good at. Good at. And in doing that, he is very similar to what computer programs like us to do nowadays, the, the modern AIs that we call them. And that's that you've made that observation. In fact, I, I think you were making that observation even during the least of all game, but certainly during our subsequent commentaries that a lot of the, the uh, certainly the master games felt like Go Sagan to you. Mm -hmm. And like you can see uh, Kitani playing this way, he's sort of doing the opposite thing. He's taking local advantages and he's not controlling the entire board position. Mm. And the interesting thing about that is that both of these strategies, although they seem to be completely opposite, they were both extremely successful. <laughs> like, Kitani was extremely successful. You're going to see him take a lead in this game at some points. After playing uh, all these moves that look so strange um, when thought of in modern context, like if we think of these moves after studying with computer programs, they just look bad, mm -hmm. and they will. They do get bad scores. Um, but the, he's when he plays a game that he likes to play. The fact is that he finds these amazing moves later on in the game that are sort of unique to this per particular player, and he makes it work very well. And 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 actually, the the disadvantage. Um, although, if you look at the scores, it might be fairly clear to see that Black has lost some points. The disadvantage is actually it's going to be very subtle. Like it's, it's not as if Black is losing by a large margin. In fact, this game, I, um, I just remembered you mentioned the, the something like a half point when you were explaining how um, the games we played these hundreds of moves and it ends up with one player sometimes just winning by a half point. Sure. Um, 
And so the half point is, has to do with the Comey, right? That black gives white. Um, so I, that reminded me, because I have to tell you, this game actually is played with no Comey. And at that time in history, uh, we usually did not have Comey. So black has, um, is starting with an advantage here. Just the initiative of having the first move gives black an advantage that most people think is about seven points. Um, well, I was going to ask this earlier, and then I didn't want to get into the whole thing, but we're going to have to address that now, especially for the, the folks who are just coming to the game new. So um, what's the simplest explanation of Comey? Since Black plays first, Black is uh, going to have an advantage. And throughout Go history, which is thousands of years, we don't actually know how, how long it is. Some, by some, some people would say it's 4,000, 5,000 years because it goes back into the depths of Chinese history and there's um, no written records anymore of when it started. So um, it's a very ancient game. Throughout most of that history, there was no Komi. So like uh, Black would have this advantage for playing the first move and would just um, tend to win more, than, more often than not. Mm. And it was in this, at this point when a lot of sponsors came in and they started to set up tournaments, which were mostly knockout tournaments, elimination tournaments, where if you lost a game, you were knocked out. Uh, then the fact that Black had an advantage became a big issue uh, because it was the first time when people could be knocked out in just one game, like right. one round. And so um, whether you had the Black Stones or the White Stones, the initiative or not, made a huge difference. It was a huge advantage that they had to make up for. And so they invented the idea of Comey, which was just saying that Black had to if Black was giving a five and a half point Comey, Black had to win by six points in order to be winning by half a point. Or if Black won by only five points, then you would subtract the Comey and White would win by half a point. So that's where the half point comes from. And that's changed. Uh, 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 and in fact, even at this point, is not a universal Comey. I mean, um, most places are six and a half. I think maybe some places are seven and a half. I mean, well, it has to do with some of the rules that we, there's a slight difference in the rule system, which is, not gonna really, get it's not changing the game itself, but um, that has to do with it. And China ha and Taiwan have uh, seven and a half point Komi. And there's some systems that use the seven and a half point Komi. And um, Japan and Korea have a six and a half point Komi, which works well for them. Right. And actually computer programs, uh, work better with the Chinese system. So they, they have a system that's very similar to the Chinese, what we call the Chinese rules, and they use what we call a seven and a half point coin. And the last thing that we'll say about this is that um, the it's, it's not just, uh, just for our chess playing friends, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a similar problem, right? When you have people of different strengths, uh, in, a, in a chess game, you have to do things like, you know, you have to give up some pieces, right? And then, of course, the game changes if you're not playing with, say, your queen or, you know, one of your, your uh, knights or whatever. Um, and so Go has this whole handicap system, uh, which basically starts with Comey. I mean, it's not, it's not uh, kind of evens that out. Um, but then uh, going up, you know, you give one, two, three, four, up to, and I forget, a lot of stones. You can give quite a few stones. Um, well, yeah, as many as you want. Usually it's just up to nine stones, but it could be nine more. Nine stones, yeah. So that, that's what, you, in fact, you'll see on this board, um, those little uh, dots on the on the sides. Most of them are still visible, yeah. Yeah, it's a nine, nine, nine dots where the traditional handicap stones are placed. Right, okay, that's enough for that. We'll, uh, we'll back to the game. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so white plays away, obviously, and could have been an A. Actually, I think the computer suggested move was white A. But um, we'll say again, it's continuing with the left side. This is a big move too. And, and this is Kitani Minori. Like, th this is really vintage Kitani Minori. This pushing here on the, you, you probably don't see it even if you're on the <laughs> button very carefully. Black pushed here on the, on the fifth line. And again, he's really happy because he's surrounding territory on the fifth line. And wait, 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 wait. he's pushing there rather rather than doing a, like a, a, a Kakari on the lower side. Yeah. I, uh, yes, obviously. I would be playing the Kakari here. <laughs> and I think I marked the board. Yeah, you see a B there. So this is where um, a computer program would want me to play. And obviously, no one's going to play that in 1939, but 
This yeah. would be a move that would be perfectly reasonable in 1939, and it's where I would be playing. I would want to play this move. Yeah, absolutely. Without it, never a, think of this one. You know, he's, he's, it's like he's a, a turtle inching one, <laughs> one inch forward at a time. And, the, and no one else in the world that I know of would, would play this style. Or if someone did, it would be a complete failure. But the amazing thing is that this works for Kitan. He can I, play this way with, and, and he had great success. Like he was one of the first eight dots. He was an eight down at the time of this, this game. And he was, um, he was an eight down before uh, Gosegen was. At the uh, time of this game, Gosegen was still a seven down. Okay. He was such a successful player and he was playing these crazy moves. That's... And then white plays away, black plays a honey, white plays away. This is just sort of an, a textbook example of white taking the big points while black is playing a lot of moves in one area. And it's supposed to be bad for black. I, I can't, I, you're, I'm going to have to see how this is not bad for black. Cause I, I mean, this is three, this is three stones that are not even captured. Well, it's not going to be something that you will find easy to emulate. <laughs> 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 it's going to be something that only Kitani can do anyway. So um, these last three moves were pretty normal. Black was taking, like, I think modern player would play all the way to the corner here, but um, just playing the middle of the side there and then extending. It's a pretty normal sequence. So at this point, we have the white uh, position here. It's not quite territory yet, but it's getting there. And the white position on this side. Yeah, so actually, I think keep going with that for, for our new players. Can you just show where the different territories are uh, for, yeah. for each player? So this is, this is what some people would call a white territory. Um, we're going to see later in the game that actually black has ways to invade it a little bit. But the basic idea is that these white stones are forming a framework and they're going to be connected in a general way. And black is not going to have very much success locally in that if black plays anything in that area. It's just going to be, black's going to be in a very passive position. And the same can be said of this area, which is, a, which is what I would call also a, a territorial framework. It's close to territory. It's not 100%. So like um, if black invades this area, then white will be able to play in a fashion to, to get the corner area. Or if black invades the other side, if black invades the corner with something like this, there is some potential for black there. But in the process, white will be getting the surrounding area. So like white can sort of count on getting something like two thirds of this entire area. Mm -hmm. So it's not, a, it's not what I would call a territory yet, but it's like a few moves away from being a complete territory. And Black's not going to be able to disrupt it completely. It also has some potential to spread out into the center in this, this mm -hmm. general area. And now, Black's territories. Black has a rock-solid territory here. And by rock-solid, I mean that we would not expect it to disappear. Go is a game that is, it, uh, morphs, morphs so easily that actually you will see territories like this um, disappear if the black player doesn't um, bother to protect them. But usually you would say that this is a rock solid black territory here, um, which white cannot penetrate. So it's more than 20 points there. And there's also this area, which is more like a territorial framework, but it's pretty solid too. So this area is an area that I would sort of expect to become black territory. So both players have these two areas. And you can see that white has, seems to have a slight space advantage. Like and the white's area in the lower right is about the same as black's area on the lower side. But white's area in the left there is just so much bigger is in the general space than black's area in the upper right. So white has a, an advantage in space, but black has an advantage in the solidity of his, his territory. Yeah, right. and, and folks, what would happen is that those areas that Mike was just sort of sketching out right now, I think that's a really good way to describe them except for the uh, upper right possibly, although one doesn't know, but um, as territorial frameworks, and then you would count, you would actually count the intersections uh, within those uh, territorial frameworks uh, as potential territory. However, um, as with so many other things in life, what does not do to count one's uh, uh, chickens before they're hatched. <laughs> and I think we're gonna see uh, that uh, yeah. Yeah. in this game. I think we're gonna actually see some good it's examples. Change. Everything changes. So like <laughs> you look at that black territory in the upper right, and it looks like it's 24 points. Like if we just 
create this imaginary line about it. And the fact is, it's not going to be that line. Um, but this is a good enough approximation at this time of the game. Like it's, right. um, for a while, it's not going to change because um, the open areas tend to be more important. So the players will leave that upper right area for a while, and then eventually it will solidify later in the game. Mm -hmm. So we're now, in, we're now, just for a reminder, folks, you have your, your openings, and in your openings, you have these, these uh, sequences of Joseckis. You then get into the middle game where there tends to be, once you've sketched out these territorial frameworks, as Michael's just explained, uh, and then there's some sort of jousting. And then in the middle game is usually when all the exciting fighting uh, happens, and then mm -hmm. uh, that will segue at some point into end game, although that gets a little squishy. Uh, end game, yeah. middle game, end game, middle game. Uh, but we're, we're, I'd say we're into the middle game pretty much by this point, right? Very good. But yeah, you, you timed your comments very perfectly here because this is where I would say the middle game starts. Mm. And I think your comments about the end game, middle game transition being squishy come from your study of the, with me, of the <laughs> AlphaGo games because AlphaGo zero makes it really, really squishy. It, it goes back and forth. Usually you have a point in the game where the territories are pretty much settled and you're just um, finishing off the details, the fine points, and that's where you're calling it the end game. And AlphaGo is pretty uh, crazy about how it can go back to a dangerous position from that point. And so there, there's some cases, some exceptions, but this is a kind of a textbook example also of, of uh, an opening tran transition to the middle game because um, one definition of the opening is when you still have these big points and this black move that was played just now at N3 is an example of a big side point. Another big side point would be here, but uh, the value of this move is somewhat reduced by the fact that black has this line of stones here making an extremely strong position. And so the value of a move in that area becomes smaller. It's a, micro, a white move there would be just that much less effective. It makes it smaller. And the fact that black is so strong there, white's move in, at the mark point, for instance, would not have very much effect on black. So the value of that area is relatively small that I would not call it an opening point, even though it's on the third line. Most opening points are on the third or fourth lines. So we're sort of out of those points that are on the sides, close to the sides of the board. And we're ready to start some fighting. So this is where we start the middle game. Right. So white plays here. Um, and this was a hot spot, according to the, to the computer programs too. Leela, I'm using Leela Zero and Karabo. It's a hot spot, but um, the computer programs wanted to play A first. And it's interesting because hmm. while I sort of believe that, we're going to see Gose can play both of those points anyway. And if, if I got into it with the computer programs or when I got into it with the computer programs, although they started with a, they're going to get to this, this move that goes second play at some point also. So it's, it's a very subtle difference. It's just the order of moves. And in the case of this game, at least, it worked this way also. So it's, um, it's sort of hard to say uh, whether actually, although he did not play the computer suggested move, uh, maybe it's okay. It, maybe this is a valid order of moves also, is, is my feeling for this. I don't completely con uh, trust these computer programs sometimes. And oh it's just that they're a black box in some cases. Now, this was an amazing move that he played. And part of it was the fact that white could feel free to play away in a position where a move at A looks so urgent. Yeah. There was that. And also, there's the fact that it's going to be amazingly effective in the following fight uh, that convinced me that was a good move. So it, I think this is one of the special moves that Gosegan played, um, even just looking at his whole career. And so usually, it would be super important for Black to play something like this. Uh, but then White's just going to play like this. And Black, um, actually, if Black plays on this side, it turns out White's going to be able to capture this stone. It's just going to be a kind of a ladder-like position. Whichever way white plays, white's going to be able to capture it. And so black has to capture this stone. White gets a position here. And just the fact that black has played all these extra stones from the inside, it makes it relatively unimportant that black is actually ending up capturing these four stones. 
the value of those stones is not as big as you would expect. And so this was not so, um, so important. It turns out that white can actually play this move at this timing, although it seems my gut instinct would be to, um, to extend here. There's a very good reason for white to play this peak first. And we're going to see it because black pushes here. And now white plays here. And it looks like um, it's, it, when we see this black move and this white move, it's sort of hard to see, just looking at this variation, it's hard to see how this exchange worked. It's hard to see how it worked. But if we go back a move and say, what happens if black plays here, then I can find an answer for you. Because if black plays here, White will start with this move, which is forcing against the upper side. Black has to answer that in order to stop white from pushing through here and breaking up that black territory. So black's going to answer like this. And the point is that white gets to play this aggressive move, the honey against black stone. Whereas the, the other option would be to just extend here, which would be very slow. It would be giving, allowing black to push white around. The fact that white can play this exchange and then play a honey here makes a world of difference. And if black cuts here, we get into this position where white is threatening to capture these two black stones with uh, the ladder here. So the ladder would be going up in a diagonal and hitting this white stone. And white would capture that black brick. Do you think we need to show the ladder? Uh, you know, uh, for our new folks, yeah, go ahead and show, show how uh, it So like if black plays something like this, white can play here. So this, this diagonal shape is what we call a ladder. And since I have a, since I'm using a computer, it's relatively painless. Unless it doesn't work, of course. Uh, but fortunately, it is working. So it's like this, and finally, it was a bit, it was a bit funny at the end. It wasn't really a diagonal, but usually the ladder is goes in a diagonal like that. And so um, you can see that white was playing just to go back a few moves. White was playing from the left and then from the right. The whole idea is that black at any point only has the one liberty and is one move away from being captured. It means that black's moves are all forced and black never really escapes from this attack. Right. Somebody said it's more like stairs, but stairs, ladder, it's all the same. The ladder. Yeah. I think folks need you to realize. Like that, um, um, like if, if this had not worked, it would have been a disaster for white. So <laughs> it is sort of, um, a bit worrying sometimes, but when it does work, you're going to end up capturing all those black stones and winning the game. Right. And, and for new players, um, you will misread a lot of ladders and, and you will have disasters and it's okay. You just resign and start another game. It's okay. But yeah. But don't keep playing after your ladder collapses. It's... Okay. Um, Usually that's okay. Usually, usually, usually good advice. Yeah. You can keep on playing if you have to. So, so I um, went on to have black play that cut there, which does save the two black stones on this side, um, because without that cut, if black had just played here to save, to prevent the ladder I was just showing, then white can capture these two stones. So there's this problem. So going back there, black will play the um, will play. Uh, let's see. Let's see if I can find the right uh, variation here. Uh, white will, uh, black will play this cut and save this side. And white cannot capture these black stones now because if white pushes against here, um, this actually is not working for white. white. White loses the fight here. You can see that these white stones here are about to be captured. So that's not working for white. So actually, the, the continuation is something like this where white has a living shape and has some stones on the outside. These stones are healthy on the outside. And this move that white has just played on the third line here at N N17 is threatening to cut black off. White has a living shape. And so this is actually perfectly OK for white. So that all of this was, he, he read that whole sequence out when he played this move. And that's pretty amazing. They did have a lot of time at the time. But the, the whole the idea of playing away when there's this super scary move at A, and the, uh, the fact that it actually works it was pretty amazing for me, um, showing the high level of this game to me. And the fact that Black really wanted to push here, but um, it, it wasn't working because of this move that White had 
and then the threat of the latter, and the fact that Black avoided that also. Um, it's very high level play by both players. And it was all mm. focused around that marked exchange, the, the exchange that I've marked here, which was sort of difficult for me to understand at first. Like when I was a, um, this is not the first time I've studied this game because <laughs> this is one of the classical games and it's one of the games that I've studied um, well before I was a professional player. When I was, how, um, how old were you when you first, when you first saw this game? Um, I, I think, um, you know, I don't have a strong memory of my first time, but it must have been in my early teens, like um, probably like. before I came to Japan. So this is something that any and you would be called an insei. Insei is is uh, is it anything like an insei in, in karate or go or or any any of the arts, right? I mean, you, it's 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 a student essentially. Um, right? Well, it's actually um, someone in a school, so like oh. it's a member of the school. And um, although they have similar stuff in in the sports that you mentioned, they might not be calling it the same thing, actually. Ah, okay. Um, they, they call um, graduate students, you say, I think, in, in universities. So it's, mm -hmm. a, it's that kind of word. But you would be expected as part of your study to study classic games, right? Obviously. Well, we were, we were given that opportunity, and it was the best way for us to improve our games because these games were very high quality and they were, since they were played with a lot of time, um, the players were not under, under time pressure. So most of the, the, that made the quality very high. And so there were games that we were, we were supposed to study and, and learn from. But, it, but like this is, this, this whole sequence that I showed you um, was not something that I would be working out before I was a professional level. Of course. So black plays there. He's, he's still very solidly taking territory. It's very typical of Kitani there. And now white plays the shoulder hit. And this is a move that um, was liked by the computer programs. Basically, uh, white could, it's not impossible, the idea that white could invade this black area, but it would usually be unwise anyway. So like playing from above here, um, inviting black to surround this area. And in the process, white is, trying to get some stones in this area so as to kind of map out, map out an area in the center of the floor. So that, that's more valuable for white than um, really diving in at some point on the third line, for instance, which would be very dangerous in this case. Um, but even if it managed to su survive, it would probably not be a good result. Um, Gosegan was very good at giving his opponent territories like this, taking a local, giving a local advantage to the opponent and taking an overall advantage in return. So now we have this solid territory in this area, which is um, getting a little bigger, bigger than it started out. So it's something close to 30 points there. And now black also has a solid area here. So this is another area that is more than 20 points and more and more close, close to 30 than 20 actually. So black has these two very solid territories and white still has a strong control over most of the board. And he pulls back once. Oh, sorry, he played this exchange. This was uh, threatening to save this white stone and inviting black to capture it. So again, it's a position where white could have uh, possibly saved this stone and survived, but it would have been very, it would not have been very beautiful just trying to save that stone. So it's much more effective for white to jump here and reinforce this general area while threatening to save that white stone with the next move. And black simply takes it. Now white pulls back. Oh, white pulls back, yes. And black plays another territorial move. So now we have something like, it's, that's more like 40 points now in the upper right, this black territory. Um, and I would be calling it a territory. Um, regardless of the fact that in the actual game, um, about half of it disappeared. <laughs> that was just something that happened later in the game. At this point, wow. it's like it looks like it's 100% Black's turn. Put that in the bank. That's like in the yeah. vault. So that's 40 points. Black has more than 20 points here. Um, Black is above 60 points. That, sh that should be enough. Usually, if you have 60 points, you should be able to win. 
Right. Um, that's just something no, people say. There's no comey, so you don't even have to pay comey. You don't even have to pay comey. Usually 60 points is enough. And I really like White's next move. Go second place here. It's a really neat move. And it's also the move that Lilo liked. Lila zero. And actually, Lila was suggesting that move one move earlier. But I am pulling back here. It, it does look like it's a kind of a slow move. And actually, I'm not going to quote him, but I think I think I seem to remember Goldhagen was giving some crazy reason for playing this move that didn't really make much sense to me. Um, and I think the real story is that he just knows Kitani so well that he knows Kitani's not going to jump in here yet. And he has one more move before Kitani's going to do anything about that um, position there, because mm -hmm. Kitani just likes to wait to the last moment. He, he really liked to do that. And so Gosegan knew that he could play this move last, this move in the center of the board last. He could, he could um, get rid of the smaller defects first and play this move last. So he was sort of playing to Kitani's style with this here. Well, he didn't have to get it, maybe. But this is something that you've talked about before. That something about uh, you know when you're when you're in the same room and breathing the same air and playing a player that you've played before. And there's there are a lot you know not to get too mystical about it, but there there are you know I completely agree with you. I'm sure that that Go Sagan he knew he, he knew he played it's just a completely so many games. as you were saying. It's a completely different level of communication and. Um, and especially with these two players, like they're very special players to each other, uh, partly because they, they, at this time in their careers, they sort of have opposite styles, but also but they, they were very close as people. They were very close friends. And they had spent a lot of time studying goals, go with each other. And they were also um, rivals in, in their careers. So there, it's a very deep engagement here. And actually, they both play um, differently when they're playing against each other. There, there's, um, it changes the way they, they play their games, basically, mm -hmm. the fact that they're playing each other. And so it's a very, um, there's very deep engagement, uh, communication going on here. Yeah. And it changes, yeah. changes their feeling about the game. And it, it makes for this kind of a class between styles because they're, they're both really happy about what they're doing. Like, Kitani has all this territory. And he's gonna um, he's he's going to wipe out the whole black white territory now, and win the game. And against any player except for Gosegan, maybe uh, that was working for him at the time. It was the way he won the game. Hey, quick question before I, I do also love this this uh, this move by Gosegan, um, but a really good question here. Got the. A player who really strongly prefers black and and wonders uh, if that says something about uh, their style or if it uh, if it should guide the kind of openings this player should play. Um, May not be a simple answer. That, that's a really difficult question. I know. Like, I know. Uh, Good question. I, I think if you're a professional player, um, the answer would probably be yes. Mm -hmm. Because just playing something that is normal and safe and what everyone else does is usually not good enough to get to the top. Mm -hmm. um, and so you do need something that's a bit hard for people to understand or different or something unique to yourself in order to be become a really great player. Uh, but when you're not a professional, um, I think it's best just to play things that you enjoy. Mm. And not really to worry about it too much, because if you enjoy the game, you're going to be doing better and playing a better game mostly. Like if, if you're not in a position that you feel excited or interested about, you're you're not going to play your best. And that's and, and to a certain extent that's true of pros also. I, but I do think we do have to sort of reason it out maybe a little bit more and try to find ways to emphasize our strong points. But like. Um, most players would get into a lot of trouble now with black because black does have to invade that loosely surrounded white area. Yeah, that's, that's and it's going to take a lot of power. Kind of a and it's, it's a very dangerous fight that black's going to get into. And 
for a player like Itani, it's going to it's going to involve a huge amount of reading. So this is this is a good point to sort of show folks what Black would be looking at. There are several invasion points and there are several reduction points. And can you sort of show the difference between the two? Well, like if Black plays, um, one of the um, things about this uh, large knight's shimari, which is what we call this shape that White has in the corner, is that it's, it's hold on the corner territory. It's just a little bit loose. Mm. And if Black plays something like one in the corner there, you can usually expect something to happen. Like there, Black will get something out of this, maybe a co or something. But once Black does that kind of thing, and we get into this kind of variation, there's also the fact that um, the territory that White gets on the other side is probably going to be pretty solidified. So, like if we um, just just for argument's sake, let's let's say something like this happens, and we get a co in the corner. Um, White will have time, for instance, to, to solidify the rest of the board. And this whole, while Black lives in the corner, this whole area will probably become a white moyo. Or maybe the line would be a bit further caved in, but it would be, be too big in any case. So that, if Black, um, it's a position where Black has various points where he can invade and erase uh, a section of White's territory. Um, the difficult part is to choose which area is most important. And in this board position, I think that the area, um, this area probably, this is the area that Kitani chose to erase. This area in the center of the board is probably the most important. Uh, yeah, this that point was that I was talking about is one of the points Black can invade. If Black goes, actually the third, the low points on this side, anything, Anything in that area looks a bit dangerous for Black. Those are usually areas where Black would be looking at points, for instance, like, like this or like this, uh, or like computer programs sometimes, sometimes play moves like this. All of these are so deep into White's area that they look very, very dangerous. Um, mm -hmm. It's actually, it's, it, when you're in the corner, it's relatively easy to make a living shape. So that's why I, was, sorry, I started by suggesting this move because it is in the corner. And so it would be relatively easy for Black to get something out of that. Um, just, I'll just show you the game move, which was played here. This is more like what seems, um, it seems to give Black potential to either escape in this direction or um, try to make some kind of a, a shape uh, in that area on the left. So the fact that it's sort of in between these two directions that Black can go either to the right or to the left it, it will eventually, hopefully, give Black some more space in this general area when White does surround it. So this this is an example of what I think is a good move for Black. Mm -hmm. uh, people are curious, I mean, once you show Katani's move as, in terms of uh, what Katago uh, favors in this position. Um, I think it was this move, yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that this this was at least one of the candidates. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember that when I researched it with Katago and Lila, both I used both of them. I did I didn't see anything that was convincing enough to um, make me make a variation, obviously. And this variation I was just making just now. So so it, I think it was my recollection is that it was this move for the computer programs also. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, this move was slightly different. Um, actually, I was really, um, I, it's a move I couldn't explain. So I, I wasn't going to show you, but I'll show you this move. <laughs> I think the idea is that white actually has a slight advantage here. And so this move is being suggested just as kind of a, a very tight move that white plays. But I, I would definitely choose Gosegan's move anytime. Like this looks like it's so much more fun. <laughs> That's yeah. that's pretty valuable. Yeah. So black plays here now. This is this is where it's going to get pretty crazy, and it's like we're entering Kitani's world of wild fighting. <laughs> he does this every time. Like he's going to start with a position that looks like it. It's such a huge local advantage for white, and in many of his games, he's going to accomplish something from that. And that's what made him such a strong player. Another option would be to play the shoulder hit. This would be the normal move. Um, 
And I think it was the computer suggested move. It's yeah. probably not going to be. Um, so like I made this variation, black will be able to live. Um, but you, you can see white's territory is building up in the, now the corner territory is pretty safe here. And white does have this territory on the side. And black is still not settled yet. So white will be able to sort of connect up to the, to the left side here eventually. And white's territory on the, white will probably have in this fight in the center of the board with the initiative so that white can start building up this territory I've uh, drawn a, I've lined up on the right on the right side. So it's important that white has, is getting solidified here and then we'll be able to um, add a stone to the, to the right side area, which is also very important. So I actually, although this is probably the more normal move and maybe the better move, I think it is sort of like a winning scenario for white. So I can understand this, but I would be super scared if I was playing black and I played here. Yeah. It's really hard to see how it works. And black cuts here. And now there's the question of how does white attack here? Wow. White, has, white has two ways to go, which both look good. And the way white played in the game was this way and like this which was chasing these stones and just leaving that black stone. When white, it's interesting in Go that when you chase stones like this with an Atari, and the Atari is this white move that white played here, I'm going to Atari and chasing these stones, it makes these two stones the important stones. The fact that white has forced black to play, add a stone there, the fact that white is trying to chase it means that now the fight will start uh, with these two black stones as the starting point. The other option white has is white could have played here, attacking the stone on the side. When white does this, the fight will be centered around these two stones that are, for the time being, they're dead. But the, the fight will be centered around the idea of how is black going to use those two stones. And it was really complicated. I don't even know if um, the variation that I'm going to show you is what Kitani was planning to do. But it's pretty clear that. Um, as it is, it's just not working for black. Like if black does something like this and like this, locally it's not working. So black has to play an attachment somewhere. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm going to say black's going to play here. I think it's pretty a high like, likelihood that Kitani was probably thinking of something like this too. And the local move for white is to cover here. And then black will cut here. And we can see it's going to sort of connect to the situation on the side. Like if we get to here, uh, now it's starting to look different. Like it, it looks like if white plays something on the top, for instance, it looks like black's going to have room to live on the side. It's, so this would be um, one variation that would probably be pretty much even. Um, oh, oops, maybe, maybe this way. Uh, pretty much even, uh, an even result where black lives on the side and white is going to continue with the center of the board. Uh, probably a big move would be to play something like this and finish off this territory here. Um, just finishing off the borderline uh, up to this point. So white would be getting a territory something like this, but it would be black's move next. So black would have the opportunity to be invading at points like this or like this, or maybe doing something on the right side of the board. So that would, and this would also be relatively close. It's, it would be an option for both players. Otherwise, if white extends here, now this is going to look like it's starting to work for black. Black will extend here and push. Uh, this is threatening. It's not a ladder this time, but it will be a squeeze. Like if white plays, if white plays here, it's going to be a squeeze. Let's see, how should black squeeze? Maybe just like this. And in this case, black is going to have a relatively good shape um, just erasing this whole area in the center of the board. You can see that white's going to get the, the side territory with a borderline, something like this. But it is sort of pressed down to the third line from the edge of the board. It's not, not as big as it could have been. So this is um, probably a success for black. Just to add a few moves. Um, White takes the three stones. And 
black will be able to cut off these white stones too. And so uh, depending on whether black plays here, it would be a fight in the center or, or black could actually play that final move somewhere around here, threatening to, to cut white off here. I'm also looking at um, some attacks on, on this white group on this side. So it, in this case, getting all these extra stones in the center of the board would give black some potential to play offensively here instead of being completely on the defensive. So I think it's important, uh, you know, there's a lot of sort of tactical stuff in here and whether you're an experienced player or certainly a new player, you know, this, this is, you know, this is sort of the, the, uh, the meat and potatoes of, of, you know, middle game fighting. There's a lot of reading. Uh, this is just a lot of experience. The, the main thing, if you can go back to the end of that sequence that you were just showing, I want to show people the end position there. Um, the, the main thing, uh, the main sort of takeaway here is that Michael had sort of sketched this out, this whole area as being sort of a white framework. But as you can see, go ahead and just do the forcing move where it takes that, right? So, so white now has on the left side in the corner, that is actually now territory. You can count that that's territory, mm -hmm. um, but black has reduced it, has pushed it down because originally you had showed a line that was actually right about where those black stones are, right? That was- Yeah, yeah, I was, I was drawing a very loose territorial line that was somewhere around here, right? That's right. And, and black, has, black has erased this whole area here. Exactly. So that was all potential white yeah. territory. Um, it, it's become a very solid territory, which is actually uh, quite similar in size to this black territory here, mm -hmm. maybe a bit larger. Right. So this is what I know, this is what often happens in the middle game. Um, well, actually for us amateurs, what often happens is if something dies. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that happens too. Yeah. yeah. So get lots of, lots of uh, fighting and, and that's what they're fighting over is uh, you know, what's, what's going to happen with the actual territories. But this mm -hmm. is still a solid middle game because there are still uh, some attackable groups, right? Yeah, well, these white stones here, if black plays that mark point, the white stones in this area here, they show, show, white show, stones show which stones are, could be attacked. Yeah, these white stones that I've right. circled here. Also, those white stones in the center with these, um, these two space jumps, are pretty notoriously dangerous because they can be cut off easily. And so the, the, all of the, those connections that White has in that area are a bit loose, so they could be cut off. Uh, for instance, let's just leave the one stone. This one White stone that is marked uh, could be cut off if, if Black, for instance, if White played something like this to connect up here, then Black could maybe keep here. It looks like Black could have some potential cutting White off somewhere. And so there's potential for black to attack also. Right, and so- and of course, Yeah, the black group is also weak. This black group is also not settled yet. And for for amateurs, of course, you know, we just love to fight because fighting, you know, it's, it's, a, it's sort of hand-to-hand, uh, -hand, uh, you know, especially for us former chess players, you know, it's all about tactics. Um, but what's going on here, there's certainly a lot of that on the local immediate level but there's also a bunch of macro calculations going on because these guys are calculate. They're already probably starting to think about endgame, right? Yeah, in general, they, they do. Like when we're talking about endgame moves on the side of the board, uh, these sort of the, the envisioning these areas uh, below the third line from the edge of the board uh, is sort of automatic for professionals. Something we've done the same kind of local position hundreds of times and it's sort of hardwired for us. So it's not mm -hmm. something that we really have to spend a lot of effort figuring out. And so it's just the areas in the center of the board in which you generally get a pretty unique position every time you play a game. And, and that's, that's what makes it difficult even for very strong players because they have to, um, like whether this move at 30 that I've just played for black, whether it's actually gonna work and how it's gonna work is going to be a unique, unique problem that is probably the players have never seen it before, the same position, the board position, mm -hmm. and they have to work it out in real time. And so this is these positions in the center um, are positions that you cannot even locally know the answer until you've spent some time thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And so this is very much middle game at this point. Still a lot of reading to be done. 
And the fact is that at this level, they're not they're not collapsing on the way to this position. So it, it does become positional. It does become, they have to assess the overall position a lot because the players are not making any local mistakes and, and they're getting to something close to an even result. Right. So a couple of things, we're just uh, coming up on our last 10 minutes. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll take this uh, on for another few minutes uh, of more of the middle game. And then, as I said, uh, when we came back, uh, we'll save the the last part because there's still plenty of game left to go uh, for for our next session, and um, you can keep track of that uh, at usgo.org. Uh, you should also subscribe to uh, the American Go e Journal. We come up um, almost daily sometimes, but certainly that's where all the news is in terms of the different things that are coming out. You can keep track of that. Uh, also, you can subscribe uh, right here in the Twitch channel. So whenever we do a stream. Uh, then you will be notified and you won't miss any of the streams. Um, and mm -hmm. you can do the same thing. You can subscribe to Michael's uh, YouTube channel and to the AGA's YouTube channel so you won't, won't miss any of that great content. So, so we'll do a few more minutes of the game. Um, and if you have other questions, uh, we'll take some of those questions before we wrap up. So, uh, Michael, back to you. In that case, I'll just show you one more variation of this 30-move variation I just showed you. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, nine, nine minutes and 50 if, seconds <laughs> if i managed to do this i would be very proud of myself it's a very dangerous fight that the players are getting into here uh -huh. and even at a professional level there would be a high potential for one of the players to make a lethal mistake at some point um and i was showing you the variation where white played uh played here to capture the three stones actually i was forgetting to show you that if white extends here black can connect and this is going to capture these two stones. And sort of an unusual shape here, but it actually works for black. Black actually has captured those two stones already. So if white plays, um, if white plays something like this, black can curl around here. And in this variation, black is on the way, black has saved these two stones also. Oh, so wow. this whole, wow. whole little section of the board has become a black territory. This would probably just be good for black. This would this would be a success for black. So that's why I was going into this variation where white captures those black stones on the left side and makes some territory. And like there's just in this 30 moves, like there's a lot of turning points where the players could have played something different. And that's what makes it so hard to judge. Like for instance, what happens if when black plays this Atari here, what happens if white plays away and starts a co? That's not something that I can easily answer. <laughs> Um, like it would be very, very difficult to make a simple answer to that. And maybe that the best answer is I don't really know. Mm -hmm. And this is all pretty close, uh, an even fight maybe. And so the players had to go through all of that and read it out. And this is a position which is very tactical and where the players are doing this huge um, amount of reading. And actually, this is I think this is the game where Kitani collapsed in the middle of the game. Um, and he, he's what, a player who's sort of notorious for using a lot of time. So he, he was just thinking too long and got to him. And I think he uh, collapsed it some, somewhere around maybe a few moves ago. And, and he had to lie down for a bit. Oh, you mean collapsed like actually collapsed? He collapsed as a human being, yeah. Oh, my God. I thought <laughs> yeah. his position collapsed. Yeah, and they had to adjourn the game for a bit. Oh, my so goodness. So there's a story about that. Um, so he was and really, he was really intense. Very intense, yes. Wow. wow. So I think it, if I only have a few minutes left, I, I, I better leave this game. The game <laughs> variation is where white played on the top. And I'm going to get excited about that one too, so I'm going to leave it. There's, a, <laughs> there's still a lot of very tactical fighting going on here. So I'll, I'll leave that for next time. That's right. Wow, good stuff. All right, so uh, a very exciting game, lots of history, um, and and uh, good good stuff to see. As I said, we'll we'll come back, and we uh, we obviously have lots more of the game to show, and uh, lots more of the history as as well to show, to talk about. Michael to talk about. Um, somebody was asking about uh, Cho Chu Kun. Yeah. Um, uh, we've talked about a lot and whether we're going to do some of those games. Um, 
I should just tell you guys, I mean, first of all, the short answer is probably yes. We we do not plan these things out way, way in advance. We we sort of, you know, take a look at the commentaries and and uh sort of see what things we haven't done. We, you know, Michael really loves the old classic game. So we did a series of those. And then mm -hmm. I, I particularly like the games from the, the the 30s and 40s. There's something about those games I I just like. So I, I was kind of pushing for those, but uh, I don't see any reason not to do some of Cho's games, right? Yeah, well, it's interesting that he's mentioned here because um, he's one of the Kitani disciples, and he's the one who picked up on this dangerous style that we're looking at right now because he's the person who liked to take territory. He did it in a different way. He didn't do it quite in the slow, uh, turtle-like way that Kitani did, but um, he did like to take solid territories and then dive into its opponent's um, potential area. Mm -hmm. So he was very similar in the destructive manner that he would just dive in very deeply. And then in some cases, he would be attacking his opponent when he was supposed to be outnumbered vastly. And so he's very similar to Kitani in his style there, and he picked that up from Kitani. Um, and yeah, he'd be a very exciting player to, to, to do some commentaries about. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're pretty open. And I think one of the things we've done before, and we'll probably do it again, is uh, just to do, uh, you know, give you several options to put a poll out uh, and see what folks want, because um, we're, we're, we're interested in almost any game from any era, um, you know, where it, it, it works for us. And, and Michael either has studied them already or is happy <laughs> for the opportunity uh, to jump in and study them if, if he hasn't. Um, already so it's it's there worth are it. a lot of great players out there a lot of great players and great players throughout and i think one of the things that michael's talked a lot about uh the great thing about being a go player in you know 2020 is you know not only do we have all the ais but the the ais are really a, a lot of you've talked about this michael i mean the ai is bringing back some some very classic moves right some of the moves have come back yeah it's really exciting to see that some of those moves that were played hundreds of years ago, um, and some of them we thought were maybe not so good, and they, they've come back with the AIs. The, the AIs like some of those moves. Mm -hmm. And so those people hundreds of years ago, some of them were, they had the right idea sometimes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we thought they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's one of the things is, you know, like with so much, you know, history, and I think this is one of the reasons why some of us really like history is that, History is really not, you know, if, if you think history is just dull, boring, you know, dusty stuff in books, it is not. <laughs> um, and you don't have to look any farther than the game of Go. I mean, the fact that, you know, AIs are uh, playing moves that are, you know, four or 500 years old uh, is, is fascinating. And so it's really useful to know that those are really old moves. Um, of course, they're playing them in different ways, right? I mean, it's not. <laughs> yeah, sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, the best example is uh, the, the move called the Shusaku Kosumi. It's, yes. It's come back, and it's, a, it's supposed to be a very good move now. Um, there was a time when we were saying that um, it was a bit um, too slow. It was, right. it was a slow move. Um, it's interesting because Shusaku himself thought that it would last forever. <laughs> so he was very confident about this move. And then in the 20th century, people were saying it was not so good, and they were denying it. And now the computers are saying Susaku is right after all. Well, and somebody was just, just talking here about, you know, playing o Ogima uh, when, when, when uh, supposedly you shouldn't. And I, I think if we've learned uh, nothing, it's that, you know, it's very hard to say there is no should or shouldn't, right? I mean, it all depends. Yeah. It all depends. <laughs> it's pretty complicated. Yeah. Like a lot of things. Like a lot of things, but as you said, you know, you should play the things that that you feel comfortable that, that you're interested with, um, or just want to see how it turns out. It, you should enjoy the game. Yes, like the pros have to win, so it, it, it changes the way we um, approach that sometimes. But right, I think uh, for an amateur player who's not whose life does not depend on winning the game or livelihood or whatever, it's I think it's an important to enjoy. Definitely should have fun. Well, I hope you've had fun watching this uh, with Michael Redmond. We certainly enjoyed having you. Thanks so much. Thanks, as always, to Stephen Fu for producing. Thanks to the American Go Association, uh, usgo.org. Uh, and thanks, of course, to Twitch. 
we will see you all next time. Thanks again for watching.